and roll. Uh, thank you for, to Karen for introducing us. Thanks to everyone who's put me on this uh, excellent film festival. Uh, thanks for you lot for coming down. We're running slightly late, so I'm not going to take questions at the end. Uh, but if you want to know anything, just stick your hand up at some point in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, I'm suffering from a brain injury, which means I've left my questions over there, so I'm going to just blur and get it now. But, uh, First things first, I wanted to say, uh, when did you first uh, have an idea to make a film about Aura Brock? And was it, was the, did the idea come before, you know, this kind of, like, potentially really serious kind of hook for the film? Uh, um, so I've been a fan of Aura Brock for uh, quite a long time, uh, but the idea of making this uh, and I follow them with the, with my camera for uh, for a year or a year and a half maybe. Mm. Um, and uh, but I, the idea of turning it into a, um, a film just came in the end of the whole thing. Uh, so the plan was not to make a film out of the material. I have some cool effects there. Carry on with these mic stands at all. Uh, so first of all, what I should have done was said, uh, "Can we have a round of applause for Andre for the film?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chell, you know, I know you. I've, we've been friends for quite a long time now, and I know you just being. I, I, I would imagine that the last thing you would ever want is somebody. Uh, following you around, filming you all the time, and uh, a less dispassionate man than me might turn around and say that could actually possibly even make you quite grumpy. Uh, why did you agree to do this? Yeah, I don't know. It was like a moment of madness. But then I, I took him at a weak point. <laughs> he, was, he was sick and uh, he was dying. And, yeah. It was, it was very easy. I, to took a, I took a loan off him at the same period. <laughs> But it worked out really well, though, and, and, and I didn't know Andre at all before it all started. I just went along with this, this crazy idea. And then after just like, a, a, I would say a day or, a, or two, I forgot about the cameras. Which is why, I guess you can see that in the film, that I mean, I, I'm, I must, you know, there's no, there's no, I, I'm not hiding anything at all. It's just me at all times. Just walking around the house in that psychedelic Adidas tracksuit top listening to The Cure. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And, you know, it's... Yeah. I, I don't want to go over too much film, uh, stuff that's in the film again, but it really... Um, so, the space between your diagnosis and the English tour was really, really short, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a matter of days. So I saw you when you played at our stage at Desert Fest, and yeah. you never said anything to me. Yeah. And we saw you, you played an amazing gig, absolutely barnstorming. It's cool. And then you were still in some fucking Camden shithole at 3 a.m. the next morning. Uh, was it like the, 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 what's it called, the Black Heart or whatever? Just yeah. imagine me going, look at these idiots. Look at them. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, I wouldn't have had you pegged down as somebody who just found out he was about to die or something. <laughs> I did some good DJing that night, John. Was yeah, it yeah. Psychedelic at that time, too? Yeah, yeah. For all the stoner rockers? Yeah, man. Yeah, we were trying to mix up disco and uh, stoner rock, and it was me and Matt Colgo. And uh, it was such a great idea that we've, no one has ever asked us to do it anywhere ever again. <laughs> Just a sort of really drunk French girl with dreadlocks came over to me, and she took the needle off the record whilst I was playing it, and she said, I hate you. Everyone in here hates you. They hate who you are and they hate what you're doing. And then she put the needle back on the record and walked up. And I was like, I don't know, I'm getting mixed signals from this girl. Um, do you feel that your voice, because like, there's one thing about your vocal style, there's very few people who have this kind of weird range. And I don't mean range in notes, I mean range of kind of styles of singing you do. Maybe like kind of Nick Cave or like uh, um, 
like so weirdly so modern rappers do it as well but like like did you feel that any of your rage was affected by what had happened yeah some of them were i guess i can, I can. yeah it was some of the weirder notes i can't do anymore but it kind of for some reason, as i said in the movies for some reason it feels like uh, it became better in a way in a strange weird way but that might have to do with with focus to or how you approach singing, you know. But in general, it's been pretty good. And that hospital where those people were great, they were checking out our YouTube videos before they started the treatment, <laughs> to, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then to yeah to make sure that I came back as I was basically. Um, so the whole experience of doing this film at a, like Chettle's wedding was really special, wasn't it? Yeah, I felt like uh, I've been a journalist and a, a writer for 10 years. And uh, when I started filming, I, I, I saw that I had to intrude another part of the life of the people I'm interviewing or, or telling a story about. And uh, I was, I, uh, it was strange to film someone's wedding to do it for a documentary. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, hard talking, asking him questions that I haven't asked myself. Because uh, I don't have the answer of what I would do if, if they told me I was going to die. I don't have a, I don't have a plan. I don't, I can't go on tour or I have a, I don't have a big project as he has with his band. Uh, so that was a, that was a new uh, thing for me to about that. I mean, the wedding day was really was as, as brilliant, but also as weird as it looks in the film, in that, like, you, you know, we've just come back off this really, really intense tour, 31 shows in 31 days, and then we were in the middle of nowhere, where everyone in the village is erecting this giant maypole to dance around, and then it's your wedding, and then as soon as the wedding, I think it was like really just a beautiful wedding, it was crying, it was so moving, and then Chattel immediately comes up to me and says, now we should do a set. Yeah. Like, and I was like, what? are you off your fucking head? I'm not, I'm not, because like what we've been doing was him playing really slow kind of doom metal, and me uh, like talking about like, you know, my experiences as a chronic alcoholic, drug addict, and uh, somebody with faith in mental health. And he was like, no, no, we'll just do it, it'll be fine. And I was like, I, I, but I really don't want to do it. And he said, but it's my wedding day. And I was like, fuck, yeah. I have to do it. And, and we did it. Yeah. Uh, and his mother-in-law of an hour looked fucking terrified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen a human being look more scared in my entire yeah, yeah. life. And you were like, no do you pointing at me. You, you kind of, as if to say, look, we've, we've done a really good show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did anyone dust? Well, later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, touring. Um, both of you tell me a little bit about touring. So there's this weird thing going on touring. I knew nothing about it. Like, I'd maybe been away for two or three days with like really big bands and just had the full like kind of whatever they call it, nightliner experience where I'm an air conditioned bus and that's it. Going away on a proper DIY tour is something else and entirely and you'll drive 10,000 miles in two months. You know, you, you will never see food better than Toby Carberry for breakfast and harvester for lunch. And you know, the, be the best you can tell you, the best you can hope for is to break even if you sell some merch or whatever. And still yet, it is one of the greatest experiences ever, isn't it? What's that about? In a weird way, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, really. It's, it's crazy. It's like, uh, why would you do this stuff? Why would you be in a band, really? Or yeah. an underground band? It's crazy. Yeah, all this stuff, crazy. Crazy, it? but yeah, it's great. So I, I don't really have an answer to why we would do that. It's just, you know, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's what we do. Um, How did you adapt to the touring life? Yeah. I don't know, I thought it was horrible. I was just uh, <laughs> wanting to go home. I had never slept so much in a car before or afterwards. I will never uh, start to play in a band. And uh, when, I, when we arrived at this place uh, earlier, I was looking at the pictures of, 
uh, on the wall here. And I think you know, there's been people here before with uh, bad economics, bad ideas, uh, and uh, I think maybe rock and roll is a bad idea. Or the best one. I mean, so, like, life being a pretty dynamic thing, you know, your life has moved on since the film, and I wanted to know, you know, you seem to cope with, like, a kind of a near-death experience, and without, without even breaking stride, you know what I mean? You know, you didn't cancel a single tour, you didn't uh, kind of halt in any of your phenomenal kind of work rate, you know, in putting out albums and EPs and doing what you call, you know, like, you know, some extra pretentious shit on the side with me. And, uh, but you know, how about since then you've become a father? Has that slowed you down more than the illness? Or <laughs> That's a good question. I yeah. think so, actually. In a, but not much, though. It's been, you know, if you, if you do stuff that I do and if focus on one thing for a really long time, it's kind of all, I'm prepared for, you know, different things. And, you know, it, I, I just have, I have this, Karen said that 20 year plan, that's a bit too much. I don't have that much of that. <laughs> that would be insane. But I have, you know, I do prepare and I have a plan for a few years ahead. And, uh, and well, we've already started to planning our tour of lighthouses, haven't we? So What's that? We've already started planning our tour of lighthouses. So. Oh my god, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Um, I mean, one of the really amazing things that's come out of this, or has it, you know, you tell me, is that now, like, you know, Karen's gone from being this awesome person that I just used to meet occasionally. Would you say this, the fact that you kind of collaborate on everything musically now, is that because of your illness? Uh, no, I, not really because of the illness, but the illness was maybe a trigger to get it started. And obviously we're in a, we live in a, in, a, in a place where we have our own studio, and it, it does help to be, you know, be focused on the same project for sure. Um, and it works out really well, so. Um, so yeah, a trigger for, you know. But I, I don't see you having any limits between your rock and roll life and your family life or your spare time. You talk in the same tone and you walk with the same clothes if you're with your baby or if we just yeah, hang yeah, out. That's true. Yeah, you're um, not like a member of Emperor who has the black metal voice, you know, yeah, yeah, on the yeah. stage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Last yeah. hour, yeah. at 11 p.m. We have some technical yeah. issues. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of merch at the back of the room. Yeah. Yeah. You should do that, so I think that'd be pretty cool. I know. Um, Andre, so like, I've seen three of your films, and like, it's weird. I don't know whether this says something about the size of Norway's music industry, or whether it was just coincidence, but I'm actually friends with two of the people that you made films on, uh, Christopher Lowe, who made the amazing uh, kind of like, like kind of slightly add on uh, brass band music that you're hearing in the background on this film, and also a film on Erling. Uh, yep. He lives so far, he lives, well, when the film's made, he lives so far up north that uh, at the darkest point of the year it got light for 20 minutes a day, I believe. Yeah. And um, what are you working on now? Uh, nothing. I, I have no, no big project because this. <laughs> I wrote film almost ruined me. So I, just, uh, so I, I just got breaking even on it. It's one year or half, one and a half years. Oh my god, I wrote. So this is my man. last project and I'm retiring. <laughs> uh, listen, um, so I mean, like, I, I, I know what the real question everyone wants to know here is and how many fucking hats do you actually own? <laughs> uh, it's not too many, it's like. Is it six or five? I sort of. I still five more than I own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not too many. I have two big ones. Uh, the one that I play with, the black one, and then big ass one, which is the white one. Yeah. yeah. And um, a couple more, but there's not too many. But you have a special order from stuff. Yeah, from the states. That they are. They are states and hats that are. Prairie states in, yeah. What's that? A prairie states in. Uh, yeah, they're called. What, Tom Mix, I think? Something like that. They, they are the highest 
the crown is yeah. the highest one. When you absolutely have to be above seven foot yeah. tall in, in a situation. Exactly. But if you don't want to become like the Wizard of Oz, that, you know, that goes too hard. <laughs> yeah. You just need a hat, like a really high hat. Do, do you think they have a list of people only owning that hat? I don't know. It's, he's a, the guy who I'm speaking to, he's, he must be an old dude because he doesn't understand my juvenile jokes or whatever. So <laughs> I tried to email him really like just yeah. the order and everything else and be really polite. Do you, so, do you get a sense that he would prefer if actual cowboys bought his hat? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it. Oh god, another Norwegian idiot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, does, uh, we're going to wrap it up a little bit earlier because like the film really, we st we've started late and we're going to do this uh, thing in a second. Does anyone have a question quickly before we wrap up? Or, uh, all right. Oh, yes, Karen. Uh, I just wondered if there was anything that you didn't want to have in the film or that you told Andre you can't film because it would have been anything to do with your medical treatment or... Yeah, for, for me? Yes. Um, yeah, I never told Andre, I kind of forgot about it. But the deal was that he was he was going to do this film, and it was going to be his film, so all of the footage was going to be his, entirely his, actually. And then, and I would get in return, you know, press photos and, and all kinds of, you know, just photos and footage, which was great. So I, I agreed to that deal. And I actually, I never saw the film before the premiere, which was at the Norway's biggest film festival. And I came there and it was full and it was like, it was crazy. It was the, the mayor of my hometown was there. <laughs> and I was like, I'd never see, I hadn't seen anything. <laughs> and I was just shrinking in my yeah. seat. It was ridiculous. My, and you don't understand that, but it, it, my diet, because I have a, my diet is very specific from where I'm from, but, but because I'm talking to Andre, who's from a different place in Norway, and because we were in Sweden, I'm kind of like, I'm talking in this stupid, like kind of posh Norwegian slick <laughs> way, which was just terrible, it was terrible. <laughs> and, and so and I... And you know, also thought this was a film about Steve is uh, Steve Albini bragging about you? Yeah, and it's going to be like a rock time the best man in the world. It was really bad, but then, you know, I see the book, so I, I don't know, yeah, so a lot of that stuff just came to me like a bomb, you know, and, and but it was fine though, and I, I think that Andre did a nice job in doing a, you know, a film that wasn't the, well, like the typical kind of rock film, like rock documentary film. So I'm I'm fine with whatever, and all of the, I mean all of that, the the sickness stuff, it's all out there anyway. So I I don't really care. It's fine. I'm, you did well, Andre. I think. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> We had a good woman at our team, uh, which is called uh, Kirsten Bullman Ross. She worked with uh, Lars von Trier. Uh, von Trier on his uh, breakthrough film, Breaking Waves, and uh, she was a good uh, uh, team player in telling this story, which turned out not to be uh, rock and roll men bragging about our robots, but a life turned into music yeah. or the other way. Uh, thanks very much to Andre and Chow. And if you bear with us for a few minutes, then we're going to do this other thing. Yeah. And who's going to join us? It's the real thing. Uh, so on stage, it'll be Karen, Chettle, me, unfortunately, for you lot, and Andrew Lars of Nurse with Wound, but he was five minutes to set up. Cheers. Woo! Yeah. 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 Yeah.